Well, conference realignment is still a huge talking point across the entire college landscape. We discuss what rivalries might look like if the Zags were going to move conferences, what the budgets of the Big Ten and the SEC mean for smaller schools like Gonzaga, and we discuss some playing time concerns for a few of Gonzaga's youngest players here on Mailbag Monday, right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. I'd also like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. I also want to thank all of you who have continued to make Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. We are into July. It is an exciting time around all of college sports, and I appreciate all of you who have continued to check the show out. And I appreciate those of you who have participated in Mailbag Monday. This is mostly a reminder for you, but for those of you who are new to the show, new to my podcast, new to Locked On Podcast, whatever it may be, Mailbag Monday. Every Monday, we answer listener-submitted questions all episode long. You can get involved multiple different ways. You can email me at andypatton013. Whenever you are thinking of a question, let me know it's for Mailbag Monday. I'll give you a response, let you know it's going to be out in the show and put you into my notes. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. Again, whenever you are thinking of a question, although it helps if you specify that it is a question for Mailbag Monday. And you can also respond to a tweet that I post every Sunday morning soliciting questions from all of you. Just find that tweet, respond to that. I'll get your question into the show. All right, we got a lot of fun stuff to cover today. This first question comes from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter. He says, if we switch conferences, Pac-12, Mountain West, or Big East, who do you think would be our rivals in each conference? Yeah, this is obviously a difficult question to answer at this point. Uh, A, not knowing whether Gonzaga is going to switch conferences. That has been the huge talking point over the weekend after USC and UCLA made the decision to switch into the Big Ten, which has potentially killed the Pac-12 or at least dramatically altered what the Pac-12 is going to look like going forward. It's unclear how much this is going to directly impact Gonzaga. Tons of great information about this decision from USC and UCLA and what it means for Gonzaga on Friday's episode. Highly recommend checking that out if you have not yet and want to learn a little bit more about what's going on in college sports. Uh, But I'll try to answer this as best I can. If Gonzaga were to switch into the Pac-12, and we're assuming that the Pac-12 doesn't go, undergo any other seismic changes, which feels unlikely. I think the obvious answer here is UW. Gonzaga already has a rivalry with UW uh, that has existed for a very long time. It's just a regional rivalry. Uh, I don't think the Pac-12 is going to continue to exist with UW a part of it. UW and Oregon are both looking to jump ship and also go into the Big Ten if possible, or at least be out of the Pac-12. If that were the case, then I think Gonzaga's rivalry would be a pretty obvious one in Washington State. I don't think they're going to find themselves in another Power 5 conference, so they're probably going to stick with whatever iteration of the Pac-12 exists when all of this is said and done, and in that case, I think Gonzaga and Washington State, were the Zags to join the Pac-12, would be a very obvious, very immediate rivalry that would exist between those two programs. Big East is kind of the big question mark. I think that there's a very reasonable expectation that Gonzaga does find themselves in the Big East in the next couple of years. I mentioned that on Friday's podcast and I'm standing by it. If that were to happen, it, again, it would depend. I think it's reasonable that the Big East may attempt to grab multiple schools from the West Coast to build a, a Western region of the Big East. I, they can't call it the Big West because that already exists, but they'll have to, they have marketing people that'll figure that part of the deal out. But I think it's pretty reasonable that if the 
the Big East is going to expand. They could pull a program like St. Mary's into the, that version of the Big East. Uh, if that were to happen, obviously St. Mary's would remain the rivalry. Uh, Kansas is being discussed as an option for the Big East. I think if Gonzaga and Kansas were both to join, I think that they would just become rivals. It's not a very regional rivalry, but there's not really, unless they pull St. Mary's, there's just not going to be a regional rivalry in the Big East. But if they were both the two newcomers, I think that they would kind of form their own natural rivalry. Were that not to happen, if we're just picking a school currently in the Big East, I guess Creighton, Creighton's kind of who I think of because Gonzaga's had some intense matchups with them before. They've played they, they've played them in non-conference before. They've played them in the NCAA tournament before. They've exchanged players before. Grant Gibbs is a primary example of that. So that's kind of my pick just because I don't see another particularly obvious choice. Gonzaga has had matchups with other schools in the Big East before. It's not like they haven't played any of them, but I just don't really see one that, that clearly makes sense uh, in the current iteration outside of kind of Creighton. And then Mountain West, I, I don't really think it's it's particularly feasible that Gonzaga is going to go into whatever iteration of the Mountain West exists after the Pac-12 presumably pulls from there to try to help kind of fix their issues in their conference. Uh, San Diego State is one that makes the most sense as a, a, a high, top-tier basketball conference. They've already had some bad blood between the two of them. They've played each other before, but I think San Diego State is potentially going to end up in the Pac-12 when all of this is said and done. Obviously, Boise State makes a ton of sense as a regional rivalry for the Zags as well because Boise is close. They're a good basketball program. Their coach is a former Gonzaga assistant coach. But again, Boise State is, is going to do whatever they can to try to get into the Pac-12 as well. So hard to answer fully right now, but I think some, some fun potential options for the Zags rivalry-wise depending on what ends up happening with them uh, in the next couple of years. Next question comes from Pete via Gmail. Pete says, it seems pretty clear that the new Big Ten and SEC will dominate college football. As that massive amount of football TV money finds its way into the Big Ten and SEC basketball budgets, do you think those conferences will be able to draw most of the best recruits and dominate the NCAA basketball tournament to the same extent that the Big Ten and SEC will dominate football playoffs? Will Gonzaga be able to compete in recruiting against these two conferences? So I think this is a fair question, and I think that it's an interesting question. I think it's worth noting that the SEC has had millions upon millions of dollars of a, a, extra football budget that has and can continue to go into the basketball programs. And yet they still haven't had a ton of success. Auburn finally had a good year last year for the first time in a while. Uh, I mean, they, they haven't been bad programs. Alabama hasn't been a bad program, but we haven't seen these programs, particularly in the SEC, really take these huge leaps forward basketball wise, even as we've seen some of those successes come on the football field. So they're not necessarily related, but the way that things are going with this, with the merger that's happening right now, if the SEC and Big Ten just collect all of the best programs in in every sport, effectively, yeah, it's going to be tough. I, I, I don't. This is not nothing. I don't think that it's 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 completely worth ignoring because of oh, football and basketball are different sports. It's going to have an impact. I mean, obviously the, those programs have already had more money than most of the other programs, which kind of leads me to my second point, uh, answering the final question, will Gonzaga still be able to compete? Yes. Gonzaga has been behind the sticks financially forever. They've never had as much money as Alabama or Auburn or any of those programs that they have consistently been better, better, better than they've been better than those programs forever. And they haven't had the same amount of money funneled through their basketball program. Now they obviously don't have football to compete with. So a bunch of most of the money that comes through Gonzaga's athletic department is, is being funneled through the basketball programs, but that they still don't have the amount of money to play with that some of those big programs do. And they have continually beat them for decades. So no, I don't think it's going to have a significant impact on Gonzaga. They will find ways to continue to get the players that they want. Their development program is so strong. They turn players who are fringe prospects into NBA players with extreme regularity. As long as they continue to do those types of things, that it's not going to matter that the top tier prospects who are going to college primarily to make a lot of money, if that's their interest, they weren't coming to Gonzaga in the first place. So I don't think it's going to make a big impact. Final question of the segment comes from Jacob Porter, too. He says, if the Zags stay in the WCC, which schools could the conference target to invite to the conference, if any? Yeah, again, it, it, it obviously depends on what's going to happen with some of these other conferences. It's a little tough to know. Uh, I kind of am operating under the assumption that the Pac-12 and the Mountain West are going to sort of merge because I think Oregon and Washington are out. We know USC and UCLA are out. 
So that's four spots the Pac-12 will want to fill to just remain the Pac-12. They don't want to drop back down to the Pac-10. So I think they're going to the Mountain West and saying, okay, who can we plug here? We can snag UNLV. We can snag San Diego State. We can snag Colorado State because those are already big research-based institutions, which has been the Pac-12's requirement for all along. So if they end up absorbing a huge chunk of the Mountain West, if there are a few schools that are kind of left in the Mountain West that don't have anywhere to go, perhaps the WCC could try to pounce on them. There aren't any super obvious candidates for that. Air Force, which is based in Colorado Springs, is like a school that's a similar size to the rest of the schools in the WCC, but they have football, of course, uh, and don't, don't fit a lot of the other parameters that most WCC schools tend to kind of operate within. Wyoming, again, is much bigger than most of the rest of the schools in the WCC, even though it's still not a particularly big institution, but it doesn't really fit in a lot of ways. Also has football, so still a challenge there. Uh, I think if they're not going to pull from the kind of remains of the Mountain West, I think that they're the, the t- same targets they've had previously are still going to be on their list. Grand Canyon is a very prominent one out of the whack. I could see them making that work, uh, even though it's a very big non religiously affiliated institution. Seattle U has often been thrown around in there. I still think that's an option. Seattle U having a good year on the basketball court last year probably helped quite a bit, although I think they're still pretty far behind the rest of the conference from a athletic department budget perspective. I think there's some big West schools they may try to plug, even though those schools have football, which makes it a challenge. I think Cal Poly makes a lot of sense. I think UC Santa Barbara makes a lot of sense. Cal Poly is not a great basketball program. Santa Barbara is a pretty good basketball program, so they could probably make that work. But again, both those schools have football. So kind of tough to see how it all shakes out, how it's going to fit. Uh, I, I think it's more likely that Gonzaga is leaving the WCC than it is that they're going to stick around to see who the WCC adds in place of BYU. Uh, but it is still kind of a, a fascinating thing to watch as as this conference, re- conference realignment continues to impact even the smaller conferences down the line. All right, we're going to come back in the second segment, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the Zags. We're going to answer some player-specific questions for next year's roster. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about LinkedIn. As the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find people you want to interview faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still powering through Mailbag Monday here as we turn into the month of July. Happy Independence Day to those who celebrate as well. Three more questions here in segment two. This first one comes from Dad Risk on Twitter, who says, over under 1.5 of the Harris, Salas, Hickman trio on the team in 23-24. Yeah, I think I got this question a while back, and I think my answer remains the same, which is over. Now, it's I don't see any of them transferring. So it's I think that... The odds of, of them not being on the roster next year are basically because one, of, one or multiple of them decide to go play professionally. Uh, obviously, transferring could happen. I don't want to rule it out entirely. I just That's not the feeling that I get from any of these three guys. And I think there's a pretty good chance that one of them does end up playing professionally. But the logjam of guards on this roster next year, of course, this trio alongside Malachi Smith, the transfer out of Chattanooga, alongside Rasir Bolton, alongside Julian Strother, who's going to play mostly in the front court, but has some guard abilities as well. I just think it's hard to imagine two of these three guys playing well enough and getting enough minutes this year to to be an NBA player. Now, Gonzaga has turned players into NBA draft picks under, you know, guys who declare early for the draft, even if they weren't huge contributors. Zach Collins came off the bench and was a one-and-done player. They've done it before. You know, we've seen guys who, who left a year early, even if they didn't play more than 25 minutes per game. 
I just, I'm not sure that I see it here. If I had to guess right now, July 4th, 2022, months and months before the season starts, I would say that I think Hunter Salas is going to go pro. I think that he has this incredible amount of athleticism and just raw ability. He's an impact defensive player right away. He's got some some stuff to work on or to, to at least prove offensively, uh, but I think he's going to do that. I think he's going to prove he's a, he's a capable enough scorer and a great defensive player that he's going to be, he's going to be gone. But I have a hard time if he pops like that, if he has a great season and plays 24, 28 minutes per game, and Malachi Smith is what Malachi Smith is expected to be. Rasir Bolton is what Rasir Bolton is. And Julian Strother plays well. Like It doesn't mean Nolan Hickman and Dominic Harris aren't going to have good seasons, but both of them can't have elite seasons. And probably it'd be surprising if even one of them had a big, big enough season to go pro. I'm just not sure I see that being able to, to happen within the confines of Gonzaga's current roster. So again, that doesn't mean there, there won't be a transfer. doesn't mean they won't decide to try to play professionally early, leave early, even if there isn't a lot of tape on them. Totally decisions that could be made there. But my gut says that two of these guys are coming back. And if I had to pick the two, I'd say Harrison Hickman are back. Hunter Salas is going pro after this next season. Next question comes from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter. He says... After seeing the jump of Walker Kessler from North Carolina to Auburn, do you see a similar situation occurring with Efton Reed? Does he have the potential to be a one-year wonder with the Zags? Uh, short answer is no, uh, and it's not because there are not similarities between Kessler and Reed. Uh, there are. They're not super similar players. Uh, obviously, Kessler was an elite rim protector, shot blocker. That's not Efton Reed's game. He, he's he's going to be an impact defensive player for Gonzaga, mostly away from the rim. He's very good at hedging on screens and playing defense out on the perimeter, which is a fantastic skill that Gonzaga can utilize from him, but he's not much of a rim protector. But outside of the the lack of similarity in their game, the biggest reason is that Walker Kessler went to Auburn and started right away. He played 30-something minutes per night or, or well over 25 minutes per night. Uh, and he was like a primary offensive and defensive cornerstone of that team. Efton Reed is not going to be that. If Drew Timmy had stayed in the NBA draft, had had not opted to return to college, then I think we could have a legitimate conversation about whether Reed is going to make a Kessler-like jump this season. But Timmy came back. <laughs> and Efton Reed, he made the decision to commit to Gonzaga knowing that that was a possibility, that that could happen. It was the reason that Dawes Amak and Johnny Broom and some of those other high-level big man transfers didn't come to Gonzaga's because they didn't know if they were going to have this. They, they didn't know. They didn't know what the role was going to look like because Drew Timmy had not made his decision. Reed was willing to accept, hey, maybe there's a chance that I don't step right into a starting role at Gonzaga. Maybe I come off the bench or maybe I play a, a secondary role. Even if I start, maybe I play power forward and I'm playing – a role alongside Timmy as opposed to being the primary guy. And so that's the reality that we're in. I think Drew Timmy, I, I think Efton Reed's going to play the majority of his minutes when Drew Timmy's on the bench. That means 15 ish minutes per game, maybe closer to 20 on days where he plays more minutes alongside Drew Timmy or Drew gets some extra rest or gets in foul trouble or whatever it may be. But I just don't see him playing consistently more than 15 to 20 minutes per game, which doesn't really give him the opportunity to be, to develop the way that Walker Kessler did at Auburn and certainly doesn't give him the opportunity to be a one-year wonder. I think he's a developmental piece who is going to be at Gonzaga for at least two, potentially three seasons as he continues to grow and develop and become the best version of himself that he can be as a basketball player. Final question for this segment comes from Dad Risk on Twitter. He says, more likely both Greg and Perry are in the 23-24 rotation, 12 plus minutes per game, or neither are. So I'm going to say neither. I, I, I think that the, the more likelihood is that one of them is in the rotation. So if I have to pick between both being in the rotation or neither being in the rotation, I'm inclined to lean towards neither. Uh, obviously, after this next next season, Drew Timmy is very likely to be gone. He can return for another season after that of COVID eligibility. I don't think that he will, but he could. Uh, Anton Watson, same situation. He will be a, he's se a senior this upcoming year, could return for a fifth season probably will not, although it's too early to tell. I don't know for sure what either of those guys are going to do, but even if we're operating under the assumption that both those players are gone after this upcoming season, I just laid out why I don't think Efton Reed is going to be gone after this season, so he'll come back. He'll step into a big role. You have Braden Huff, who's going to be an incoming freshman this year. I don't expect him to play a ton. We'll talk about that more in the third segment, but he's going to be a piece for the roster in 23-24, and then you have Greg, and then you have Perry, and that's without adding anybody else. 
No newcomers in the class of 2023 outside of Dusty Stromer, but they're going to add more to that class. No transfers whatsoever. That's what it would take for both of those guys to be rotation pieces at this point. Now, of course, the Zags could still add a transfer and both Greg and Perry could still be rotation pieces if they're ahead of, say, Braden Huff in the uh, in the depth chart. But I, I just have a hard time seeing a situation where both of those guys are key rotation pieces by that time. I, I just think unless they both develop very strongly, which there's concerns about both of their development. Perry is mostly because of injuries, unfortunately. Greg has not developed much on the defensive end of the floor. Uh, they're still both very young. They both could still kind of break out in a small role this year and be ready to be big time contributors. That could happen. But I'm more inclined to believe that maybe one of them transfers and maybe one of them ends up being the fourth big and neither of them end up being big time contributors in the rotation by 23-24. All right, two segments down. We're going to come back in the third segment and answer even more listener submitted questions. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. College basketball may be over, but the NBA finals are still raging on, and the MLB, NBA, or excuse me, the MLB, WNBA, and more continue on into the summer. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. Bet Online remains the best spot for all of your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all of the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still hammering through listener-submitted questions here on Mailbag Monday, Independence Day version of Mailbag Monday. This first question for this final segment comes from Dad Risk on Twitter. He says, is it time to start talking about Dusty Stromer as a possible one-and-done guy? Dude looks like a baller. Not going to be shocked if he's one of the best players in the 23-24 team. Uh, so the... Specific question, is it time to talk about that? No, I don't talk about guys being one and done guys until they've played like at least 10 games in college, uh, at least a game, certainly uh, with Chet Holmgren and Jalen Suggs. It was kind of a, a predetermined conclusion that they were going to be one and dones, but that is not the case with Stromer. And it hasn't been the case with anybody else who has put on a Gonzaga uniform. And the only other player who has actually become a one and done is Zach Collins. And that was a surprise. Zach Collins was, of course, a five star recruit. Uh, but he was a late addition to the five-star recruiting or to the five-star family. And he was a backup center who didn't even start for that team. So no, I, I don't think that we should ever put one and done expectations on a kid who hasn't played in college yet. Do I think that it's possible? Yes, but we've seen Gonzaga recruit a lot of players who get a lot of helium after Gonzaga is in on them. This is a testament to Gonzaga's ability to recruit and identify talent really, really early. They're very good at finding guys and visiting with guys and offering guys and then having those players really blow up after that, in part because Gonzaga just knew what they were doing. But we haven't seen a lot of those guys get so much helium that they come to Gonzaga, start right away as freshmen, and then have have the kind of season where they could be a one and done. We've seen Julian Strother, Dominic Harris, both guys who – got recruited by Gonzaga, ended up being top 50, top 40 players in their class, the same as Dusty Stromer, and those guys played about seven minutes per game as freshmen. Hunter South is the number six ranked recruit in his class and came off the bench as a freshman. Nolan Hickman, decommitted from Kentucky, was I think top 20 in his class, played 15 or so minutes per game as a freshman. So I, I think that the Dusty getting more attention and moving up the, the rankings and becoming the kind of the kind of kid that like, yeah, we should be very, very excited about doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to come in as on that 23, 24 team and immediately start and play the kind of minutes and play the kind of role that he would need to play in order to be a one and done player. It's hard to know what the roster is going to look like in 23-24. I you know, Rasir Bolton's going to be gone. Julian Strother very likely going to be gone. I think Malachi Smith's probably going to be gone. I, I think one of Dom 
Hickman and Salas is going to be gone, as I laid out in a previous question. So, yeah, Dusty could step into a big role, but Gonzaga could also add more guards via the transfer portal, uh, they, which they've done a bunch of in the past. It's not unheard of for them to add multiple guards to the same team at once. I think it's possible that one or two of those other guys return. So it's hard to know what Dusty's role is going to look like as a freshman, but I would be pretty surprised if he came, became all the way a one and done. That has th- That development for Gonzaga players has almost never happened. So it would be surprising to see that happen here. Next question comes from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter. He says, which prospects the Zags are perusing do you recommend we keep our eye on? Shout out to using the word perusing here. I love that. I uh, will start with Mookie, Mook, Mookie. Let's try that again. We'll start with Mookie Cook, who decommitted from Oregon. Super exciting wing prospect. Uh, he's from Jefferson, Oregon, a local kid. He came to Gonzaga. He checked the campus out in February. Uh, I think it was for a St. Mary's game. And then he listed his top three which was Oregon, Kentucky, Gonzaga. And then he committed to Oregon. And then less than two months later, he decommitted from Oregon. Does that mean that Gonzaga and Kentucky are the only schools he's considering? No, probably not, frankly. He's likely going to reopen his commitment entirely and get a a sense of other schools that are interested in him. But Gonzaga is probably still pretty interested here, and they're probably going to make another strong pitch to try to get him. And it would be foolish to not think that they're at least at, towards the top of his list uh, for destinations starting in 2023. A couple other names to keep an eye on. Caden Cooper is a wing out of Oklahoma in the class of 2023. Uh, he's a three-star per 24-7's composite rankings, but he's a four-star and a top 100 recruit according to 24-7 themselves. Uh, he has been offered by Gonzaga, so we know that they're interested in him joining the 2023 class. And um, then Jamari Phillips is a 2024 guard out of Modesto, California. He is currently ranked 15th in the class of 2024. That's a long ways from now, obviously, but still a really, really talented young high school kid right now. Uh, Gonzaga is known to be interested in him, so that's another name to keep an eye on. Final question of the show comes from Daniel via Twitter DM. Daniel says, do you see Braden Huff sneaking into the rotation at all next year, or is he going to get the Greg Perry treatment in year one? Yeah, I think he's buried pretty far, buried pretty far on the bench in year one. I, I Mark Few doesn't really like to play freshman. We kind of touched on that in the Dusty Stromer question there. Uh, he doesn't play freshman unless they need to play, unless they're Jalen Suggs or Chet Holmgren, or obviously there have been other freshmen who have played, but you, it's it's unusual. It's not all that common for Mark Few to carve out playing time for true freshmen, and and they don't need him. The best case scenario for Braden Huff in terms of role on this roster is fourth big. He's going to be behind Drew Timmy. Zero percent debate about that. He's going to be behind Efton Reed and Anton Watson. Frankly, there's a zero percent debate about either of those things too. Huff is probably good enough to potentially outplay both Caden Perry and Ben Gregg for minutes, and he could then play fourth big man minutes. But again, that's the fourth big man. We're not counting Julian Strother as a four, but I have maintained on this podcast that I believe Strother is going to play the majority of his minutes at the four, which means that the rest of the minutes at the four and all of the minutes at the five are going to be soaked up by Timmy, by Reed, by Watson. So I kind of don't think that any of Greg Perry or Huff are going to play significant minutes for this team because I just don't know where they would come from. Obviously, injuries could change the conversation. There's certainly factors we're not thinking about right now but at this point i don't see playing time really out there for for any of those three guys and i think if there was playing time to go around for one of those three guys few's probably not going to go with the freshman he's probably going to go with with if if caden perry's healthy he's probably going to go with caden perry if perry's dealing with back stuff he's probably going to go with ben greg and that doesn't mean that huff won't be a better player even by the end of the season or going into next season but i think if if playing time were to be dished out right now. I think Huff is pretty low on the list, despite being, you know, the new kid coming in a, a fairly high ranked prospect. Obviously he's Mr. Illinois uh, in his home state. So he's, he's a talented basketball player, but I think he's more of a developmental piece. That's going to make his mark two, maybe three years down the line, but not necessarily in year one. All right. That is going to do it for me today. We have a very fun conversation lined up with a Gonzaga coach, which is going to go live on Tuesday morning. We also have an NBA insider coming on the pod that we're going to talk to lined up for Wednesday. So don't miss very, very exciting week of Locked On Zags available wherever you get your podcasts and of course available on YouTube as well. Finally, thank you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Locked On WCC doesn't exist yet and we might want it to be Locked On Big East in a few years anyway, but You can get more informed on the West Coast happenings, and there are a lot of them, by making Locked On Pac-12 your second listen of the day. 
Host Spencer McLaughlin and the local experts of Locked On take you across the Pac-12 in 30 minutes, five times per week. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.